Today, we're gonna to share with you again how we make our stovetop covers or noodle boards. We're going to be a little more detailed and specific this time and share some valuable tips with you along the way. First, let's talk dimensions. Uh, this customer ordered a 30 by 24 inch stove cover through our website. And we like to first make it a little oversized and then dial it back to final size at the end. Since the lumber we have for this is nine feet by 10 inches, we're gonna be able to do a cool effect and have the wood grain going vertically. This is really gonna highlight the cool wood grain that Babinga has. Building the stove cover this way means we're gonna need four boards to make sure it's wide enough. So we'll take our overall length and then cut our four pieces out of that. The only thing we need to make sure is that they're all well over 24 inches in length. And I'm no mathologist, but I think it's gonna work out. <laughs> now that they are cut to rough length, let's lay these boards out again and kind of get a feel of where we're going. We like the busy part of the grain to be matched up together. That way it kind of forms two bands in the stove cover. Kind of makes me think of two pillars of smoke or two columns of vines or something like that. Now let's get these boards plain so we have two flat and parallel faces. Hey, and if you're interested, we actually sell these on our website at firstfruitsdesigncode.com. We need to edge join them next, but before we do, we're gonna go lay them out again. Before edge joining, I always make sure the fence is set to 90 degrees, uh, but we're gonna show you here something you can do to ensure that you get perfect edges that glue up every time. We like to number all the boards in order of the pattern, and then on each edge, we'll write either out or in. This'll tell us in a little bit which way the board will be facing as it's fed through the joiner. The first pass at the joiner will be all the edges that are marked out. Once the outs are joined, we'll get the opposite edge ripped parallel at the table saw. All we're doing here is taking off the minimal amount of material necessary to get a parallel and flat edge. So obviously we're removing material, and even though it is just like a real small amount, that can add up. So it's a real good idea to make sure you build oversize and then trim down to final size later. Now it's back to the joiner to join the in edge of the board. Opposite of what we did before with the out edge, we're gonna be turning the face grain towards the fence. Now that the edges are ready, we're going to lay them out and arrange them numerically, making sure that the pattern is still the way that we want it to look. Joining the edges this way ensures that even if your fence is off from 90 degrees a little bit at the joiner, you're still going to have perfectly flat edges at glue up. Also, as we kind of alluded to earlier, you're gonna have the faces of the boards be coplanar to each other. Now it's glue up time. We have been using the panel clamps from Rockler now for a little while, and we love them. They're definitely not a silver bullet, but they really do make the post glue up boards pretty close to perfect compared to when we were using the bar clamps. Yeah, way better. And hey, if you're enjoying this video, please give it a like and we really appreciate your support. All right, so now we'll get it out of clamps and scrape the glue lines and then we will sand it up to 220 grit, making sure to water raise the grain between each grit. We always need a good cup of coffee to repair our soul after sanding and you can repair yours too by purchasing one of these First Fruits Design Co. mugs at our website. Hashtag shameless plug. All right, next step is to get the juice groove and design carved in over at the CNC. Since we'll be carving both sides, we'll put a mark on the center of the board at the front edge so the carvings are centered over each other. I also like to mark the center point on both board faces as the starting point for the carvings. Done with the CNC and it's back to the workbench to cut to final dimension with the track saw. We need to first get a straight edge on the top of the board by taking off just enough to get it straight and square. Since the CNC work is centered to the mark on the board that we made, we'll simply measure out half of the total dimensions from there so that we can mark out our cut lines. If you've watched our other videos, you probably noticed that we love a little bit of slow motion track saw cutting. So soothing. Over at the table saw, we can then cut the chamfer. We line it up to make sure it's not going to cut into our juice grooves. And then we simply just cut a chamfer on opposite sides of the board without moving the fence. 
When it comes to cutting the remaining sides, we need to ease into that cut so that the chamfer lines meet up. We'll make an intentionally wide cut and then just tap the fence until they line up nicely. Once it meets up, we can leave the fence where it's at and then make the remaining cut. And if all of our layout and mathing was correct, we will be good to go. Mathology. It's science. This board now gets any needed cleanup from the CNC work with just a chisel and then hand sanded to 320 grit with a mineral oil finish. Our customer had mentioned that he was interested in Babinga, but he seemed a little reluctant because of the material cost. I had to purchase more anyway for our new wine caddy design. Video coming soon. And imagine my surprise when my hardwood dealer sold me this Babinga at the White Oak price. I don't know if it's just the holiday season or the fact that this customer was uh, really nice and easygoing, but we had to pass on the savings. So we were super happy to give him a Babinga stove cover at a White Oak price. So that, in a little more detail, is how we make our stovetop covers. And that's how we roll.